Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone on uh, on Twitch TV. Hello. Welcome to RWTV. Uh, can I? Uh, I'm Richard B. Can I uh, introduce my colleagues, uh, Marlisa Raza, Darren Lai, and Camilia? Mal, can you introduce yourself first, Mal? Hello, hi everyone. Hi, Mal. Good afternoon. Uh, yes. I'm Marlisa Raza, one of the panelists at uh, RWTV. Hi. Hi, Mal. Uh, so uh, then, uh, can I invite Darren Lai? Darren, can you introduce yourself, please? Hello. Hello, everybody. My name is Darren Lai. Um, also, uh, well, today today is my first time doing this Twitch TV. So, yep, glad to be here. Yeah, people say it's always the first time. Camilla, can I uh, trouble you to introduce, introduce yourself, please, Camilla? Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Camilla Young, and I'm a paralegal at Richard B. Chambers. Thanks, Kemi. Uh, thank you for setting up this um, live uh, broadcast. I see a few people have been uh, now logging on to watch. Thank you so much. Uh, so today, um, uh, yes, uh, we have uh, we have someone saying hello, hello. Uh, uh, nice, uh, Chair P. Da Tato. Okay, sorry, I I'm, I probably am the oldest man uh, in Twitch. Uh, you know, uh, so still trying to get used to the language of Twitch. So my apologies if I sound outdated, <laughs> out of place. Okay, today's uh, Twitch TV, RWC Twitch TV, we do this every now and then, usually on Mondays, but today is a special day because it's uh, the second anniversary for the Richard V. Chambers. And this Twitch TV, we usually um, uh, have um, uh, this uh, legal aid clinic, where at the legal clinic we will conduct discussions uh, and um, uh, open up dialogues with uh, the community in Twitch. Any question, ask me anything, ask us anything, and then we will try to respond. And then, yes, uh, thank you for your anniversary wish, uh, uh, Chapi Dato. <laughs> thank you. So, uh, can I um, perhaps uh, invite uh, Marlisa Raza to? share a few words about uh, today being our anniversary and uh, what are uh, the, the plans for today's talk. Uh, all yours, Mal. Oh, all right. Okay. Thank you, Richard. Um, so, hi, everyone. Again, Marilyn and Sarah are here. Um, I, I just want to wish a happy anniversary to Richard Wee Chambers. I've been with Richard Wee Chambers since its first inception. Uh, in 2019. I'm very, very happy to celebrate the second anniversary of the firm uh, here today together with my fellow partners, Richard Lee and Darren Lai and of course, uh, uh, Kem Kemi. Um, to the rest, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this very, very special date for RWC. Um, not easy to, to, you know, go to its uh, second anniversary, so I'm very, very happy uh, for today, what we're going to do is, again, like Richard mentioned, it is our uh, usual RWC Legal Aid Clinic. So we are here to any legal questions you may have. Uh, just post us any questions. And if we can, we will answer your questions accordingly. All right. And I think um, Kemi will also be asking us a few questions, uh, if, if I understand correctly. So, yeah, let's let's start. <laughs> yeah. Let's start, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Mal. And uh, today being a special day for the firm, it's also a special day for Darren Lai. Uh, Darren has been a um, member of the Malaysian Bar for more than 10 years. Um, old man. But uh, yeah, more Malaysian Bar <laughs> more than 10 years. Good friend of mine. Uh, really proud to have him on board as a firm. Uh, welcome aboard, Darren. Maybe you would like to say any welcoming comments, uh, probably as your first ever speech as an RWC member, uh, uh, partner. Good for the introduction. Thank you. Um, well, so hello, everyone. Darren Lai here. Um, as as uh, Richard mentioned, old man. <laughs> not not as old as Richard, maybe. But oh, anyway. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> I agree, I agree, yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, as mentioned, today is RWC's second anniversary. Um, and I'm also very proud to announce that um, I have today joined RWC as a partner. 
So uh, everything falls into place today. So as as mentioned, this is the first time that I'm appearing on Twitch TV, giving um, legal aid clinics. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to join in more uh, as time goes on. Um, so yeah, same thing here. Uh, legal aid, we will try to help out as much as we can. Um, do throw us um, uh, legal questions uh, if you need any, if you have any, and then uh, we'll try our best to answer. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Darren. Really welcome aboard, as we said earlier. And uh, we got a nice comment here from Chappy uh, saying, Congrats, Darren. So, oh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you, Chappy. Thank you very much. Much obliged. And of course, uh, Kemi, um, uh, can I invite you to just say a few words as a moderator for today? Oh, yeah. Um, I would like to start off by, of course, wishing RWC second happy second anniversary again. Uh, I think it's a really big milestone. The past two years, uh, even though I've just only joined the law firm, but I can see that RWC has made an impact in many new industries in, in Malaysia. And uh, for today, I really hope to be able to have some meaningful dialogues with our viewers uh, to be able to help out any way we can. Any uh, questions you guys might have on anything legal, even if it's not legal, so we can also try to help today. So please feel free to ask uh, whatever you want in, in the comment box. Thanks, thanks, Kemi. Um, just to let everyone know here, uh, a lot of our talks have been recorded and then um, uh, we then download the, the talk from here, the webinar from here, and re-upload on RWC YouTube. So in the past, there's been interviews between Kemi and I, interviews between me and Benny Tay from Ipo, the Para Esports. Um, uh, I would say one of the leading characters of Para Esports. We also interviewed Tash Bunny, who is a, a fairly popular um, streamer. Uh, we had a very good discussion about uh, rights of e uh, streaming rights at the time. And then, of course, there's the very famous and well-known, and I am proud to call him as a friend, uh, Farouk, a.k.a. Flower, or Flavor, as you, as you can say. Then um, he was also instrumental in, uh, in one of our talks, and he actually asked me some really difficult questions in that talk. Um, uh, so... We've had some really good webinars and debates in the past. Today, our talk will only be about half an hour to 45 minutes. We've always kept it short and sweet. And oh, hello to Flus the Cat. Uh, then, uh, uh, yes, Chappy, Benite is the Chakoe Konezia. Correct, correct. Uh, and yes, Flava is our idol too. <laughs> yeah. So without further ado, uh, maybe Kemi can kickstart by posing a question where one of the partners uh, can attempt to share our thoughts about it before we open the video to the floor uh, so that anybody from the floor can ask us a question. All yours, Kimmy? Yes, uh, thank you, Richard. Right, um, so since we're on Twitch TV and we all know that Twitch is uh, primarily a gamer's uh, website, um, there's uh, an issue on gaming in esports actually um, that I would like to ask. So recently there's been um, a match fixing scandal very close to home in Singapore, uh, whereby a team of esports players, so these are professional players who are paid to join tournaments, uh, one of them has been found guilty by the publishing uh, company of that game, um, Riot, of match fixing. So basically, he agreed to play really badly in a tournament so that and he bet on his own team to lose so he was found guilty and they were banned and in the new Straits times uh news article that uh came up with this news at the end there was this uh mention under current anti-corruption laws in singapore those found guilty of match fixing may be jailed for up to five years and fined up to one hundred thousand sing dollars so my question is this um, are there such laws in Malaysia? So let's say a Malaysian professional gamer that is guilty of match fixing. So other than being banned from the game, are there laws like making this a crime in Malaysia? Yeah, thanks, thanks. Okay, I'm going to get Darren to try and answer this, <laughs> but it is about resurgence. I recall, right? The team resurgence. Yes. And this is a tournament held last year. I can't remember the month. And it was something about 2-0 defeat, something 2-0, uh, some game, right? And 
uh, if I'm not mistaken, the game was uh, organized by Valeron. Uh, yes, the, the game is Valorant and the company is Riot. So it's the Valorant Esports limb of Riot. Yeah. I see, I see. But I, I cannot remember what game was it though. Was it Dota Valorant. 2 PUBG? Oh, Valorant. Also, so Valorant is the game. So, okay, yeah, Valorant go. is the game. It's a shooting uh, game. Anybody who so, yeah. people just watch it and say, I see Richard doesn't know Esports. So yeah, <laughs> we're trying to... Um, uh uh keep that with the new games every month you know uh so i i i struggle sometimes but luckily for me i understand the structure and the way the game works so uh maybe uh, uh darren you want to try that first uh, uh is there any laws in malaysia which will um uh yeah Chappy, let's play Valorant. yeah you can teach me uh, let's go for it then uh maybe uh um we can try that, uh, uh, Darren. Any laws? Is it under MACC penal code, or which for match fixing? You know, all yours. Thanks, Richard. Well, uh, to start with, um, I also don't know the game called Valorant. <laughs> I know Counter Strike. Uh, yes. But you are a Dota two player. You play Dota two, yeah. I don't, like, don't say lah. I say <laughs> unranked player. <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, yeah, so I, I had a quick look at that uh, incident. So apparently what happened is that um, the said player played badly and um, with the hope that the team manager does not um, take note of it. So, and why did he play badly is because of, also allegedly is because he had made a bet against his own team. He has put a wager against his own team. So, um, there are, um, in Malaysia, I don't think there are any specific law on e-sports or e-gaming. Um, but in terms of this, um, it, it, it has elements of uh, corruption. Okay. So, when there's elements of corruption, the MACC Act, which is the uh, anti-corruption agency in Malaysia. So, the MACC Act will come in and this act, Predominantly is to curb corruption. Um, from MACC Act, there are a few offenses. For example, um, Section 16, uh, 16 and 17A uh, pertaining to soliciting or receiving gratification, which in other words, simply put, is bribe. Um, then 17B, there's offering or giving gratification bribe. Uh, or 18 intending to deceive uh i.e a false claim well i i am to be honest i'm no expert in um in in, in corruption laws <laughs> okay but um in i mean in match fixing we do not know i mean in that in that particular case uh, match fixing usually will involve some form of gratification i.e um receiving of bribes receiving of monies so I would believe that if it is a match fixing issue, um, some form of gratification, some form of bribes are involved, then the MACC Act will be uh, applicable and that is punishable by law. In terms of the of the, of the, of the uh, punishment, I am, am not too sure about this. Perhaps Richard or Mao, you, you know the punishment? Well, are you familiar with that, Ma? Hi. Um, to be honest, not really. Um, not familiar with mm -hmm. But yes, I do agree with, with uh, that in match fixing that to go under the Corruption Act and um, it is punishable by law. So, get back to you on the punishment. Yeah. From, from what I understand, um, uh, to add a layer to what you say, um, Darren, um, I hope I don't lose my signal. Good, my my Wi-Fi has been up and down my house. And by the way, shout out to Guardian Angel, uh, aka Brian, who's a former member of RWC. Uh, how are you, man? Uh, Brian, thanks for joining us. Uh, in Hokkien, people say, "Come here, come here." Now, um, uh, there are actually other than the um, this 
MACC Act, um, uh, Darren, actually, we also need to look at the penal code. Uh, there are penal code where, for example, um, I think you can look at the section 120. Uh, I had a quick Google and I, I remember there's something in the penal code. I just saw section 120A of the penal code, which talks about illegal betting, you know. So that, that definitely comes to, therefore, in short, when you do that, when you do, when you fix matches, it is actually a criminal law offence uh, and that person can be charged in court and uh, may even go to prison for a few months or a few years. So uh, what happened in Singapore where the players were suspended, but I don't see, correct me if I'm wrong, Camille, I don't see anything about the players being in prison, no charge in court. Am I no, right? No, yes. They were not mm. arrested and they were not charged. It's just uh, at the end, it was a note by, I think, the New Straits Times themselves. I see, I see. So, yeah, that, that's the situation lah, at the moment. At the moment. Um, but, yeah, I suppose in Malaysia, this is how I will do it. <clears throat> if an esports player is um, fixing matches, uh, internally, the, the team should take an action against the player. Once there's sufficient evidence, uh, the team obviously internally will discuss with the player and, and I, I can imagine the discussion will be quite heated and upset and uh, probably will lead to the expulsion of that player. And uh, then it's up to the team whether the team wants to lodge a police report uh, or in this case, if the tournament is organised by the certain organiser, you go to the organiser to report or alternatively, you can go to Malaysian Esports Federation, MESF, which is the main governing body for esports, they may have authorities to do this. And there's always MESPA, the Malaysian Esports Players Association. MESPA can always, uh, while, while MESPA doesn't have a power to punish the player, but MESPA definitely have a uh, have a, the authority to talk to the player, you know, and, and maybe even um, uh, remind the players of their responsibility. So these are the things which can be done. But in terms of uh, punishment, the player can be uh, banned from that team. The tournament organizer can ban that player from joining future tournaments. Um, and of course, uh, if MESF can take action, I'm not sure. I stand corrected. They can. And last but not least, I hope we don't go there. But if we have to, we have to, which is criminal law to take the person to prison. That's how I will answer, like, Camilla. That's very interesting. How likely is it that the police will actually come and arrest a gamer for doing this? Well, like, if there's enough evidence, they will. Yeah, I'm sure they will. And it's, uh, to be fair, the police are inundated. they got lots of cases. As you know now, half the time they are fighting COVID-19 on a roadblock. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, to be fair, I think uh, uh, Darren and I have experienced dealing with them in safer Malaysia in the past. Uh, they will investigate such a case yeah. right thank you that's a very comprehensive answer okay um <laughs> should we uh, open the question bank to the yeah in fact i was going to ask mal mal uh, have experience in fintech and uh, you know her experience in uh, tourism while it may not look like it's directly connected to esports but there have already been talks of fintech and esports uh uh, collaborating, you know, uh, if you Google through, you can find many fintech companies and esports companies working together. So, before we talk about the collaboration, maybe Mal, you can share with us a few minutes of your experience in fintech and taking into account yesterday was the deadline for the di digital banking license. So, uh, anything general you want to share with us about fintech, uh, Mal? Well, I think uh, people in the esports community would be very, very familiar with the area of fintech because um, it is correlated in some ways. It is related to digital, it is related to technology, it is related to, um, you know, things which are not, uh, what do you call this, you can hold it, right? It is very uh, technology based. Uh, so I think people in the community would, would understand how fintech works and um, just a general definition of fintech, it is financial technology. So whatever you're using currently with regards to your accounts, with regards to your savings, with regards to your expenses, like for example, e-wallets, 
um, any payment made through payment gateway are all fintechs. Um, and uh, like Richard mentioned, the, there was um, a deadline for digital bank license yesterday, um, which you can apply to Bank Negara Malaysia, which is the authoritarian body in Malaysia. Um, uh, I think in terms of my experience, fintech is ever growing, just like esports. Esports in Malaysia suddenly bloomed within a couple of years, and I think even fintech is the same. Uh, in Malaysia, fintech e-wallets especially suddenly bloomed within the last two years. Uh, a lot of companies came out with their own e-wallets, uh, you know, just internal e-wallets or uh, e-wallets with a third party where you can make payment to another another party. So um, uh, it is a very interesting area, I would say. Uh, probably a community in esports will want to venture into fintech because you already understand the uh, basis of technology. So uh, it will be an interesting thing if these two areas come together and perhaps do something about the area. So, but please, no match fixing um, uh, <laughs> used in fintech, okay? <laughs> please don't do that. But yes, uh, I think it would be an, in, an interesting um, uh, invention or rather innovation if fintech and esports come together. So yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, in fact, I echo you, uh, Mark. I read that uh, many esports um, um, businesses uh, they are looking at the uh, involvement of e-wallets because there are many acquisition buy and sell uh, on e-sports platforms. So uh, e-wallets already been there for quite some time, and I think the collaboration will go uh, more uh, more uh, exclusive in years to come. So I actually feel the next big thing for e-sports uh, is actually fintech, fintech and e-sports. It's it's a natural. Uh, collaboration, quite natural. May, may I just add, I also realized that um, there are also um, sale of some gaming credits via some e-wallets available in the market right now. Yeah, I was so, about to, to say that as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. There is an so, yeah, emergence of that exactly uh, in, in the esports community, I think, in terms of buying and selling game credits and, you know, um, within within esports or within the games you have certain things that you want to buy uh you know like your weapon la this la that la so all that kind of stuff you know fintech comes into play uh and um there is already a lead actually uh previous few months ago um uh transaction using bitcoin so bitcoin is also fintech uh so they, they want to sell um things within the game using bitcoin so it's, it's a very interesting uh, area, I think. And, and esports and fintech, if they come together, I think the world will be, be changed a lot in that sense. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. Uh, esports e definitely one of the fastest growing industries in Malaysia other than fintech. Yeah. Um, uh, and then moving from there, uh, um, Darren, I know you've quite extensive experience in litigation uh maybe you want to share with us some of your litigation experiences dealing obviously no no litigation in esports uh but maybe you have any interesting litigation cases you may want to share maybe about company fraudulent uh, uh internal disputes which does happen in esports every esports is controlled by companies so eventually every company will have their own challenges uh, would you like to share something there? Yeah, Richard, sure. Thanks. Um, well, I mean, just, just to get back into the, the, the topic, the forum, which is esports and fintech, right? Um, well, I mean, eventually esports or even fintech, it's all in the end uh, money and also um, a lot of the corporation direct uh, responsibilities, whatnot. So, um, yeah. I mean, in terms of litigation, what I foresee in terms of esports, for example, will be contractuals, contractual disputes. Um, I mean, with, with, if like what you're saying, esports is growing so fast, there's bound to be money in it. 
um, and there's bound to be disputes in it. So uh, when so it, it can get into a bit of a messy situation where dispute resolution will have to to kick in, you know. So um, well, I personally have have done cases involving um, shareholders disputes. Um, uh, breach of fiduciary, a uh, breach of director's duties, um, uh, and, and all these things can get a bit messy uh, when companies are actually formed. So it applies equally as well, I think, in, in esports. Um, if a company is formed, um, some, you know, some shareholders or directors start acting funny and doing things which are, which are not in the best interest of the company, you know, so all these things can lead to litigation uh and can lead to 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 a fight in court in general i mean there's there's so much i can i can speak more about um uh in litigation but uh this is just touching base a bit lah. yeah i suppose if Mar marlon you talk about litigation can go on for a few days and worse still if i talk i'll go on for a few weeks you know how talkative i am so yeah yeah quite a lot of things we can discuss but Personally, Darren Marl, I, I haven't seen any uh, litigation for esports. Have you seen any, Emilia? I have not seen much litigation on esports. Not in Malaysia. Yeah, um, but I, I did, okay. you wrote an article, Camilla, on this. The recent uh, disputes around the world. Can you, oh, can around you the share world, definitely. Yeah, uh, maybe you can share some with us here. It doesn't. It's not uh, specifically esports because. Um, Esports and gaming, even though they are quite an intersection, they are actually very, very different things. So gaming would be, litigation related to gaming would be, for example, there will be IP issues where people use, um, people use art that they shouldn't be using in their games. Like, and you would be surprised, like some of the biggest developers in the world, they actually do these kind of things. You would think that they would know not to, but they still do, and then it gets brought to court. And then there will be, uh, for esports, there will be um, contractual issues, like uh, like what um, Mr. Darren said just now. Definitely contractual issues, because let's say the player um, wants to change teams, but then his team doesn't want to let him go. So where does that, you know, leave things? Because maybe when he signed the contract, he was only 17 years old. Um, so he doesn't know what he's signing. So when he wants to change teams, uh, the buyout costs, the fees that the new team has to pay is too high. So he's stuck there. So mm -hmm. then it gets brought to court. So these are uh, types of litigation that we can see in esports and gaming. Mm -hmm. well, Actually, most, uh, most of like, um, you know, our usual uh, sports litigation as well, isn't it? Like, for example, um, football players, you know, they have this uh, contractual issue until there's a buyout clause whatsoever. So it's very, very similar. In yep, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, I'm just sharing a link here, which was uh, recently drafted by uh, Camilla, right? Camilla, I think I remember you wrote, you wrote this. Then, um, and this is, of course, part three. The first part actually is drafted by the person who's here, uh, uh, Brian Boo, Guardian Angel. <laughs> he was the first person who drafted it, you know, our part one. Uh, so now we've got part three. If you go to the RWC website, you'll see three parts of uh, articles. Every year we, we do this. We annually update the community with uh, legal disputes of esports around the world. And, and we put it into our article. In fact, it may be time to update it, isn't it, Camilla? Uh, yeah, so yeah, we may... Definitely. 